So this is by Aryan Ambikar. I have seen many people glorifying Mughals, even though they were very cruel. These people also said that Shivaji Maharaj was a coward. My question is, out of so many Mughal kings, is there anyone who deserves appreciation? I appreciate one or two works of Akbar, but not all. Is there someone who was an ethical Mughal leader? Right, good question, Aryan. So first of all, I would like to say this, that anybody who considers Shivaji Maharaj to be a coward needs to have their head examined. Shivaji Maharaj was not a king. He was an emperor. He reconquered the entirety of India, almost the entirety of India from the Turkic invaders. And he established political union and political unity of India. He established what he described as Hindavi Swarajya. So he won independence for us from our invaders and our occupiers. So that is what he achieved. One man in one lifetime was able to free the whole of India from the foreign invader. That is a monumental achievement. I think I would consider Shivaji Maharaj to be one of the greatest kings of our land in the, at least the past thousand years, maybe in the past 2000 years as well. So, so that is about uh, Shivaji Maharaj. Now, is there any Mughal leader who was an ethical leader? So to answer this sort of question, the best way to do it is to do a comparison, right? So the Mughals were invaders. They were foreigners who came to India. Their later generations were born in India and they ruled this country for uh, several generations of their dynasty. Now there is another dynasty which were also invaders who also ruled India and these are the Kushans. So the Kushans were essentially from modern day Xinjiang, the region north of Tibet, which is currently occupied illegally by China. So the Kushans were from that region, from the Tarim River Basin region, and they invaded India from the north and they occupied India, they conquered India, and they ruled it for several generations. And the, one of their greatest emperors was Kanishka, Kanishka the Great. So let us compare someone like Akbar with someone like Kanishka, because these are both descendants of invaders, descendants of foreigners, who both, we can say that they made India their homeland, right? So let us compare, let us compare the rule and the uh, methodology of ruling of these two kings. So Kanishka the Great, if you look at his life and his career, he promoted India's national interest relentlessly. He, he spent his whole life promoting and furthering India's national interest. He conquered vast territories north and west of the Himalayas. His kingdom, his empire stretched from the Caspian Sea to the Aral Sea all the way into northern India and all the way into eastern India. He also reconquered the Tarim River Basin from the Chinese. And not only did he expand India's sphere of influence militarily, he spent a great deal of energy in expanding India's cultural influence worldwide. So he was a great patron of the arts and of culture and philosophy and religion, right? He held one of the, one of the major Buddhist conferences in Kashmir, where Buddhist scholars from all over the civilized world came and uh, they, they had uh, discussions and seminars and they expanded upon each other's knowledge. And not only did he do this, Kanishka, he also sent Dharmic missionaries to the East. So at the, the, there was this time when, uh, during Kanishka's time, that India was trading with this new formed Chinese civilization. And we were sending merchants and traders, whole caravans of these people to China to, to trade with them. And Kanishka ensured that every such caravan of merchants and traders would carry a few Buddhist monks with them. And these were not just Buddhist monks, these were monks who were well versed in all the Dharmic scriptures, the Vedas and the Buddhist uh, philosophy as well. So he, because of these actions of Kanishka, Indian culture and India's sphere of influence expanded immensely. We essentially conquered China culturally without ever sending a soldier across. So this is what Kanishka did. He expanded India's national interest economically, militarily and culturally. This is what Kanishka did. Even though he was a foreigner, he made India his, ho his own, not just as an invader and occupier, but he, he promoted India's culture. So he did more than most other kings would do to promote and further and enrich India's indigenous 
culture. So that is Kanishka. Now let's compare that with Akbar. My only question to you is, you already, all of us, we learn about Akbar in our uh, studies, right? In our history textbooks. Show me anything comparable that Ak Akbar did for India's indigenous culture. I don't see anything that he did to promote India's indigenous culture. And militarily also, he did not expand India's sphere of influence beyond the present day Himalayan boundaries, right? He did not cross the Himalayas. He did not go eastwards or westwards and expand India's sphere of influence militarily. So Akbar is considered to be the greatest of the Mughals, the most tolerant, the most uh, secular, etc. Well, if you compare Akbar, who was a foreigner, or descendant of foreigners with Kanishka, who was also a descendant of foreigners, I would Kanish, I would consider Kanishka to be an immense, immensely greater king and emperor than Akbar ever could be. So, so if you were to compare Akbar with the, if you were to compare the Mughals with the Kushans, there is no comparison. The Kushans were far more Indianized, and they were far more. Uh, they did much more for India than the Mughals ever did. The Mughals were extractive in nature. They did not contribute much to India. The Kushans contributed an immense deal. So that's what my answer would be that uh, ethical, I, I don't know what how to define ethics, but there was nothing great about any of the Mughals. There is nothing good that they contributed to India. 